Good morning. We welcome you to the worship services of the Waverly Church of Christ. Your speaker this morning, Jeff Keel. Your song leader, Larry Hayes. Four hundred seventy two. Four seventy two. Following this song, Brother Price White will read the scriptures to us, and then Brother George Palmer will lead us in our opening prayer. turn your Bibles to Colossians 3 I'll be reading verses 12 through 14 I told Jeff I was just going to read the whole chapter he said go ahead (laughs) Colossians 3 verses 12 through 14 therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved put on tender mercy 
kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. <clears throat> Please bow with me. Most Holy Father in heaven, we come to you this morning giving thanks for the many blessings you give us. We thank you most for your son Jesus who was willing to die on a cross so that we could spend eternity with you in heaven. We thank you for our health. We thank you for your church. We thank you for the congregation here, and we ask that you continue to bless each and every member here, bless the efforts of the church that we may be successful in spreading your word, and we ask you to please give the increase. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our physical families and our friends and our church family. We ask you to be with those who are not able to be here, the many who are sick, and I would add this morning that we ask for your prayers that Dennis Cordova may have successful surgery tomorrow and may recover. We ask that you be with the leaders of this church, that they may lead us in the direction that you would have us to go. We ask that you be with the leaders of the land, that they might look to you for guidance rather than going in their own directions directed by the devil. We ask, Lord, that you be with the families who have lost loved ones recently and we ask your blessing on the deputy sheriff's family in Dixon. We ask that you make us mindful of the brevity of life, that we would not put off until tomorrow the things we need to do today to serve you as you would have us serve. Lord, we know that you love us and the only thing you ask from us in return is our love and obedience to your commands. We ask that you go with us through this service today that everything might be done pleasing and in order and that we might worship you always in a way which is pleasing to you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins, not only the things we commit, which are against your teaching, but the many things we leave undone that we should do. Go with us through the service, guide us and direct us, and in heaven save us. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Number 538. 538. My hope is filled.
If you would, mark number 885. 8, 885 will be the song following Jeff's lesson. And before the lesson, number 452. 452. Shall we stand for this song, please? standing on the promises of God. Isn't that true? It is good to see you as we come together this morning to worship our God, and I appreciate so much the songs that Larry has led and the prayers that has been prayed and the scripture that's been read. Actually, what Price said, or somebody encouraged him to read Psalm 119. And if he had started reading Psalm 119, there would have been probably no sermon this morning. I would just had to have stood up here and said, y'all come. Because if you know the Psalms, that is the longest psalm in all of the psalms. So it would have taken a while to get through it, but that's fine. Because God's Word is much more important than anything I might say. I just try to expound upon it a little bit. Wouldn't it be great if all of us who are Christians here this morning were perfect I mean by that, wouldn't, wouldn't it be easier to maintain Christian unity in this body of Christians if none of us had any quirks or imperfections or idiosyncrasies? I'm reminded of the two old Quakers that were talking with one another, and one of them said to the other, you know, sometimes I think that everyone in the world is a little off except for thee and me. And sometimes I'm not too sure about thee. The truth is, every single one of us in this room this morning are different in our own way. And perhaps in the eyes of another Christian, we may be a little quirky, a little different at times. I know I've been described that way at one time or another. You know, we wonder why everyone else doesn't see things quite exactly the same way we do, and that's really not hard to explain because we're different. If you're married here this morning, you understand it. And I say that because when you bring two people together who come from different backgrounds, 
They are different in their personalities. They are different in their genders. Sooner or later, you're going to have a misunderstanding and some conflict in that marriage. And when you add to that mix some children, then the potential for all of that just increases. Now let's expand it even more. When you take and put more than 200 of us together, as there are this morning in this room, you can imagine how much different we are in so many ways and how much our experiences are different, our thoughts are different, and in so many things we may not always see eye to eye on, eat, on things. And just as it is in a family, and just as it is in a marriage, the only way that we maintain unity in those relationships is we have to practice a little forbearance. Or, as Paul puts it, bearing with one another. And that's what our text is about this morning. How do we present a united front? How do we work together as a body of Christians? And Paul says that we have to bear with one another. And in order for that to happen... There are a couple of things that he brings out I want us to see this morning. Number one, we have to understand our relationship to God as Christians, how he views us. And then number two, there are some things that Paul tells us we need to put on in our own lives if we're going to be able to bear with one another and to forbear with one another. And those are the things I want us to consider this morning because if we're going to have as a church the drawing power that the gospel has in this community, then we've got to be a people who others see as having this forbearing spirit and that they want to be a part of this group of people that we call the body of Christ. So let's begin and look at what Paul says. He first of all begins in talking about bearing with one another and tells us that God's treatment of us is the basis for which we are to treat one another. Have you ever stopped and thought about how God sees you? If you're a Christian here this morning, Paul tells us. He begins by saying that as those whom God has chosen, holy and beloved. Three things he brings out. Number one, he tells us that God has chosen us. If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, you find that this is the same way Moses, or the same thing Moses said about the Israelites. He said, God has chosen you. But he, he specified something there in verse 7. He said there that God did not, or the Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, or he says, for you are the fewest of the nations, or all the peoples, but he says God chose you because he loved you. You and I have been chosen by God. And if you're a Christian here this morning, then you know that God made a decision to choose you and to choose to save you in his Son before he ever formed this world. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. And because of this, if you go over to Romans chapter 8, Paul asked a question. He said, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Or as the New International Version puts it, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? You are those people that God has chosen. And Paul's answer to that is, it's God who justifies. So he chose us. Men, do you remember when you, you said, I'm going to marry that woman? You chose her. You made a decision at some point that you were going to go to her and you were going to say, will you marry me? And maybe you even went to her father and, and you asked for his permission to marry his daughter. But you chose her as your bride. You wanted her to spend the rest of her life with you. God has chosen us to be his people. But in choosing us, he also says something else. He declared each one of us to be holy. 
Once we obeyed the gospel and were immersed in Christ and our sins were taken away, God set us apart from the rest of the world. He consecrated us to himself. And it's just as you who are husbands and you who are wives here this morning have done for each other. You, when you stood wherever you may have stood, and you were wed together as husband and wife, you were set apart at that point in time for that other person. As a matter of fact, the words you spoke to each other may have been something like this. Do you solemnly promise before God and these witnesses that you will love, honor, and cherish this person until death do you part, and that you will keep yourself from all others until God by death does separate you. You see, you made a promise all those years ago that you were set apart for that individual. Well, as Christians, we're set apart for God. We're declared to be holy. We belong to Him. We don't belong to this world. This world is not our home anymore. We're just passing through. We've got something far better laid up for us. And then there's that third thing He says about us. He calls us His beloved. I love... If you go to that beautiful poem that we find in the Old Testament that we call the Song of Solomon, you find that phrase used several times, but one of those is over in chapter 6, verse 3 of the Song of Solomon, in which his wife says, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. I belong to him, and he belongs to me. I love him, and he loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, we sing. Why? Young people know the answer, because the Bible tells me so. God calls us his special object of love, because he has sent his son to die for us. And in the same way, me and your wife is that special object of your love. You have promised to love her until death separates you from her. And so God calls us. We are, as Paul said, God's chosen. We are declared by him to be holy. And he has said to us that we are his beloved. And because of that, this new relationship that you and I, who are Christians, have with God, it sets out how we are to treat one another. And what do I mean by that? Well, when you and I see ourselves as the chosen objects of God's special love, when we realize that we have been set apart by Him, for Him, then we are enabled to reach out and, and love each other and respond to each other in a way that, that overlooks the differences that we may have in our lives. Maybe you are a parent who at one time or another has had one of, one of your children who's gotten married and maybe they've called you up and, and they've said to you, do you know what so-and-so said to me the other day? And you just smile as a parent and you think, okay, know what's coming. And then you have to tell them, you know, you made a decision to marry that individual, warts and all, so you're going to have to learn how to accept some of those differences that you didn't realize were there when, back when you were dating, and you're going to have to work through those things. And it's really interesting, maybe if you've got that special relationship with that daughter-in-law or son-in-law, and one of them calls and says, let me tell you what your daughter did the other day. It's no longer my wife, it's your daughter. Or let me tell you what your son said the other day. Oh, I thought he's your husband. Well, he's your son right now. You understand that. You've been down that road perhaps. But you see, we love each other and we overlook those things because God has chosen us. Folks, if we are dependent upon somebody else's response to us for our sense of security as far as who we are in the body of Christ then we will not risk allowing ourselves to be rejected by someone. And I want to tell you this morning that if you're expecting everybody to love you and everybody to be kind to you and everybody to always do everything you want for you, you're going to be sadly disappointed because that doesn't always happen, does it? There are times when even our spouses may say, no. What? No. Or get it yourself. And we learn that everybody doesn't always cater to what we want. 
But if we are secure in God's love, then we can be strengthened even when those around us do not return the love that we may show to them. If somebody insults us, then we don't feel that we... It hurts, yes, but we don't feel like we have to retaliate. Instead, we as Christians should do what Peter said over in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, because there he says that we are not to return evil for evil or insult for insult. He said, instead, what we are to do is give a blessing. It's hard to do at times. But that's what we do when we bear with one another. We reach out and bless instead. But then there's that other side of it that Paul tells us. He says that we are to put on some things. And our ability to bear with one another means that one of the things that we have to do, it requires it, that we need to put on certain qualities in our lives. And I want to make two observations before we look at these qualities in depth. And the first observation is this. Every single one of us here this morning who wears the name of Christ, every single one of us who calls ourselves a Christian should have these character qualities in our lives. Now, does that mean that we are all going to have the same generic personality? No. You don't even find that in Scripture. Barnabas had, I no doubt, these qualities. But was Barnabas like Paul? No. Barnabas was not like Paul because they couldn't get along. They eventually had to go their separate ways, continuing to spread the gospel. And was Paul like Peter? No. But each of these individuals, no doubt, had these qualities in their own lives. And in his creation, what God has done is he has placed a variety of personality types in his creation, in the world, and we're not all alike. And one of the things that God does as he works on us and hones us as Christians is he works to knock some of the rough edges off of our personalities. But he doesn't change us to the extent that we... He erases all differences in our lives because in this building, there are some of you that we would call hard-driving people. You're go-getters. You don't let any grass grow under your feet. There are some of you that are just laid back. Oh, I'll get to it in a little bit. But you don't get in a hurry. And it frustrates those that are hard driving, especially if you're married to a person like that. There are some of you in this room this morning that are what we call extroverts. It means you never meet a stranger. You're an outgoing personality type. There are some of you that are introverts. Don't ask me to stand before a group of people. I don't do that. As a matter of fact, it makes me nervous to be in a room full of people. There are some of you here this morning that are people-oriented. You love to work with people and you love to be involved in the lives of people. And there are some of you that you're more task-oriented. Just tell me what I need to do. Do I need to build something? Do I need to make something? Do I need to clean something? I can do that, but don't ask me to go work with people. I know individuals who are mechanics that they love all day to work on a piece of machinery, but ask them to stand behind a counter and work with customers coming in? Uh Uh-uh, I can't do that because I don't handle real well somebody coming in with something or more that's torn up or broken, and they want it fixed yesterday because their grass is already this tall. And I want to say to them, why didn't you bring it in to me four months ago before the grass started growing? I didn't need it fixed then. You see, but we're all those different types of people. And the quicker we realize that, that we're not all the same, the easier it is to bear with one another. But the second observation is this. Jesus Christ modeled these qualities in his life. He was a compassionate individual. He was kind. How many times do we read in Scripture that seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited, or dispirited like sheep without a shepherd? Matthew 9, 36. Or he goes ashore and he sees a large crowd, Matthew 14, 14, and he feels compassion upon them and heals their sick. He was humble. He was gentle. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and what? And I will give you rest. Why? Because I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. 
That was Jesus. He was an individual that was patient. He was forbearing. He was forgiving. Even though he was reviled, Peter says he didn't revile in return. While he was suffering, he uttered no threats. That was Jesus. Even when he was hanging on the cross, Luke records for us that he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He had these qualities. And if we're going to be Christ-like, we want to work to develop these qualities in the way that we interact with each other. So here they are. We need to put on what the King James calls tender mercies. It is what the New American Standard calls a heart of compassion. It's an emotional term. It is, it is a term that means that we are touched by the needs of those around us and we respond in an appropriate way to try to meet those needs. It's what we see in parables that Jesus tells. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? There in Luke chapter 10, what do we find? The Good Samaritan comes along, he sees the, sees the wounded traveler along the side of the road, and he felt compassion for him. And he gets off of his beast of burden, and he bandages up the wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and then carries him to an inn and cares for him. Or the story of the father and the prodigal son. What does the father do when he sees the son coming home? He runs to meet him. He felt compassion for him. And he embraces him. You see, that is the way compassion responds. And then in Jesus himself, he felt compassion for the widow of Nain who had lost her only son. He felt compassion for the multitudes as we saw just a moment ago. Folks, if you and I like, lack compassion for one another, most likely it's because we're too focused upon ourselves and not upon what's going on in the life of someone else. And yet that's what, if we're going to bear with one another, we've got to be a compassionate people. People that truly care for the needs of those around us. I appreciate the prayers this morning for those that are undergoing difficult times, for those that have lost loved ones. That indicates compassion. But not only that, kindness is something we have to put on. You realize that kindness is one of the, a part of the fruit of the Spirit that we see there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22? Kindness means that we're benevolent, we're courteous toward those around us. If you go to Acts chapter 28, there in the very beginning of that chapter, you may remember that Paul is on his way to Rome. He is going there to stand before Caesar and argue his case, if you will. He's got Roman soldiers that are guarding him. And when the ship finally runs aground and is broken apart because of the waves, they, everyone is able to get ashore. The island there is the island of Malta. It's raining. It's cold. And, and the thing that Luke says there is that the islanders, the natives of the island, he says, showed extraordinary kindness toward them. How did they do that? They lit a fire in order for them to, to get warm because it was cold. Or if you look in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, one of the things that, that Paul tells us there is that God shows kindness toward us and that the purpose of the kindness that he shows us is to lead us to repentance. That's its goal. Well, let me ask you a question. As Christians, do we show kindness toward others? And does the kindness that we show, is it a type of kindness that will lead them to want to know Christ? Because that's what we need to be doing, showing a kindness that says to others, I care about you, and I want you to know the one I know. So we put on these things. We put on a heart of compassion. We put on kindness. And we put on also humility. Literally, this is a word that means lowliness of mind. It does not mean that we're ever one stepping stone. Some people have mistaken it. The Greeks even didn't like the word because they felt like it was just not a good word. It showed weakness. But yet, we realize that God has given all of us, this is what kindness does, it realizes that God has given us everything that we have. 
the blessings that we enjoy, they've been given to us by God. And, and kindness recognizes that in and of ourselves, we are weak. We can't do things, but God does those things in and through us. We trust in His strength. There but by the grace of God go I. Paul would say in, in, in praying that his thorn in the flesh might be removed, God's statement to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. And so he would be an individual who would reach out to others because God enabled him to do that. I can do all things, Paul said, through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. It's reaching out. And, and folks, in, in, in talking about, I said kindness, didn't I? Humility. Where am I at? Humility is the word I'm thinking about. But in, in talking about humility, humility is something that we do for others in the way we respond to them. Christ is the supreme example of that humility. Philippians chapter 2. He did not consider his equality with God something that he had to hold on to. But what did he do? He emptied himself, took on the form of a servant, was found in fashion as a man, and, and, and humbled himself even to the obedience of death upon the cross. And we're called to this same type of humility. We, we don't think, as Paul said, more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Instead, what we do, as you see over there in Philippians chapter 2, down specifically in verse 3 and 4, is that we regard one another as more important than ourselves. It's what we do when we're humble people. We look out, and, and that's what bearing with one another has to do, is we look out at our brothers and our sisters in Christ, and we, we say, I need to care for this individual. I need to reach out to that individual because their needs are more important than mine. One of the things that, that in a recent funeral I had done, somebody told me about this man, and I'm not going to call his name, but said, you know, even when he was in the nursing home, and somebody was being cared for, so they came to care for him, he'd say, I think that person needs more help than I need right now. He was still, even at the latter stages of his life, regarding others as more important than himself. What about us? Is it evident that when others are around us that we consider their needs and what's important for them and what we can do for them? Or as the topic of, of, topic of our conversation, let me tell you what I've done and who I am and where I'm going in life. Humility looks out for others. Two more he brings out. Gentleness. King James uses the word meekness. Simply put, it's called strength under control. Some of you are old enough to remember a time when Maybe your father or maybe even you worked with a team of mules. You know, those, those mules could have drugged you or that individual all over the countryside if they had wanted to. But that strength, they had been trained, they had been worked with so that that strength was under your control. And you could use them and harness them to pull a log or to plow a field because that strength was being used in a controlled way. That is what gentleness is. You realize that the most meek individual in all of the earth, according to the Holy Spirit, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, was the man Moses. As a matter of fact, we read that Moses was very meek more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. That's the way the English Standard Version translates it. But having said that, Moses was a man, when you read about him, that could act who could act decisively. He could be as hard as nails when he needed to be. Remember when he ground up that that idol and took that gold dust and sprinkled it in the water and made the people drink it, that took a little bit of fortitude on his part. So he could do that. He could rise in anger when he needed to. Remember when he broke the tablets of stone? Both of those two things happened at the same time. He was angry. But God referred to him as a very humble man, a meek and gentle individual. And that is what we have here. 
when we put on gentleness, when we put on meekness, then we place ourselves under God's control and we allow ourselves to be used by God in whatever way he sees we need to be used. And folks, we need gentle people in the body of Christ. We need people who when others look at us, they see someone that they want around them, someone that cares for them. And then there's that last one, patience. Are you a patient individual? Some of you might know I'm not patient at all. I want it done yesterday. I don't like having to wait for anything. And yet patience is one another part of that fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22. I love the way the King James translation translates the Greek there. It uses the phrase long-suffering. You know anybody that's long-suffering lately? Some of you mothers probably would be considered long-suffering. You have put up with some things and put up with some things. And, you know, it's only when those of us who are your children finally have children of your own that we realize just how much you really did put up with. And I've known some other individuals that, have, that have later have said to me, you know, I went back to my mother and I apologized to her for what I put her through because... Now that I've got children of my own, I realize what I was like. You know, when we are long-suffering, when we are patient, we don't get upset with the little things. We don't make mountains out of molehills. No, we bear with our brothers and sisters in Christ because we realize that all of us are growing in our faith. And that we could say, even as Paul there, but by the grace of God go I. God has been patient with me. What am I trying to say this morning? It's this. If we're going to bear with one another, folks, we have to realize God is born with us. And he still calls us his chosen, his holy ones, his beloved, because of his great love for us. And it involves that we ourselves, if we're going to care for each other, we've got to put on these things. We've got to have compassion for one another. We've got to show kindness to one another. We've got to be humble around each other and, and treat each other in a gentle way and be patient with one another. And beyond all of that, one of the things that he says that, that Christ read for us just a moment ago is that we've got to be willing to forgive. And, and the basis of our forgiveness is the fact that God has forgiven us. We owe God far more than anyone in this audience will ever owe anyone else. And yet God was willing to forgive. And if God can forgive us for our great offense against Him, certainly we can forgive one another for what small offenses we have. But there's one thing that He brings out here in verse 14 that binds all of this together. It's love. Our young people, and we've sung it in this audience before, a song that talks about a hymn, bind us together. I think Larry has read it on several occasions. Bind us together with cords or chains, depending on the version you're singing, that cannot be broken. Bind us together in love. And that's what love does. It binds us together. Let me ask you a question, maybe several questions. Can others outside of this building see that we are a people who bear with one another? Or do they see us as people that are fighting with one another? Do the people outside these doors see us and see this place as a place where forgiveness is practiced on a regular basis? Do they see us as a people who are bound together with a love that just nothing is going to break that love? Parents, have you ever gotten on to two of your children, maybe one of them, because they've mistreated a brother or a sister, and you've said to them, we're family, and family does not treat family this way. You love your brother. You love your sister. And that's what we are. We're family. And because we're family, as we've been looking at all of these different things about what we do for one another, we bear with one another. So let's ask God 
to help us be what he calls us to be so that we can bear with one another and love one another and forgive one another and be kind and, and courteous to one another and do all of these things so that we might draw people to him. That's the ultimate goal, to draw people to him and to get there, our heavenly home, ourself. If there's this morning anyone in this audience that you know as a Christian, I've not practiced these things. I've not been bearing with others. I've been short. I've been, I've been unkind to people. I've not been gentle with people. I've not been patient with people. I've not been forgiving. This morning, ask God to forgive you for that and help you to become that person. But this morning, if you're a person here who's not a Christian, whose sins have not been washed away in the blood of Christ, I want you to know that we're not perfect. We have our idiosyncrasies. We have our quirks. And you probably have seen them at times. But we want you to know that we're forgiven in the blood of Christ. And as imperfect as we are, His blood is going to cleanse us till the day we die. And He wants to take us home to be with Him, and He wants to do that with you. And this morning, if you need that forgiveness in your life, if you need the cleansing of your sin, if you need today to become a child of God, a Christian, and be buried with Christ in baptism, then His invitation is for you. And we ask you this morning, won't you come as together we stand and sing. My God, my Father, Jesus left an example for us on how to observe his death and his resurrection. At the table, he told the apostles, this is my bread, the leavened bread that he passed around. This represents my body. Then he took the fruit of the vine and gave them drink and said, this is my blood. We know the requirement for this is every first day of the week that we observe this. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the bread, for this which represents our, the body of Jesus as he was brutally wounded and then carried and placed upon a cross to suffer and to die there without any broken bones. As we partake of this bread, may we always remember this death, this sacrifice that Jesus made for us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Also, Heavenly Father, we come back to thee in prayer. We're thankful for this fruit of the vine, which represents that blood that was shed on the cross when the spear was pierced in his side, the water and the blood came forth. It's only through the shedding of this blood that we can have forgiveness of sins. We're thankful for Jesus, for his sacrifice. May we take this in a manner that's pleasing. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Heavenly Father, as we conclude this service for this Sunday morning, we're thankful, Father, for everything that Thou hast done, allowing Jesus to come to this earth, allowing Jesus to give that sacrifice. We no longer have to do a, a meat sacrifice and shed blood from the animals. Jesus did this once and for all for each one of us. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunity that we can assemble and worship on the first day of the week and sing these songs of praise to thee and hear a portion of thy word and come to thee in prayer to fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters as a family. We pray, Father, for those outside the church that have not confessed thy name and have not followed thy word and studied thy word to realize we're 2,000 years in the time. We know that the Lord will return in the sky. We know that that time is closer than ever. We don't know the exact time. No one knows except God. We pray, Father, for those that have left the church. We pray that they will recognize that they're in sin and that they need to repent and come back and be a part of this fellowship or the fellowship in the church somewhere. We pray, Father, that as we go home, be with us, keep us safe, and may we always live a life that's well done in thy service for you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. This has been the worship services of the Waverly Church of Christ. Your speaker this morning was Jeff Keel. We want to again reiterate that if you need anything from the church, if you just need prayers or if you need anything from us to go out and do for you, please let us know. You can visit our website at www.waverlychurchofchrist.org or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wavcoc and help us spread and share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you need to call us, our phone number is 931-296-3213. Again, we hope that you have a blessed day.